Um, good afternoon. And I would like to first thank the TED and US team for putting together this wonderful event and giving me a chance to talk about monkeys for 17 minutes. So, <laughs> what, is, what is so special about this monkey? The monkey is the bennett leaf monkeys. And you can see from this picture, they are black in color with some white bands along the inner thighs and also the stomach area. Now, the bennett leaf monkeys, they are big animals. They are some two to three times the size of the common long-tailed macaques you see at the reservoirs that you might be more familiar with. And these animals, but they're very shy. So they rarely come down to the ground. They're very fast, uh, hide up in the trees, and very elusive. So let me first introduce uh, the four primates we have in Singapore. I mentioned the bennett leaf monkeys. They are critically endangered due to a low population size. And we have these small, fluffy, toy-like slow lorries. They are also critically endangered in Singapore. OK, so the long-term macaques. So you see them pretty often at reservoirs, really enjoying the day. They are doing pretty well having a stable population. And a lot of people forget that humans, <laughs> we ourselves, we are also primate species. And for, well, Singaporeans, we are probably threatened, as the government says, because of a low reproduction rate. Something. <laughs> okay, so let us now focus our attention on the bennett leaf monkeys in Singapore. A long time ago, up to the 1920s, they are very common throughout Singapore. So they can be found in forested areas um, throughout the island. But with rapid urbanization, um, forests had to be cleared for roads, for buildings, and subsequently their numbers declined tremendously. And they became restricted to just two nature reserves in Singapore. So the bigger one, Central Catchment Nature Reserve, and also the Bukit Timah Nature Reserve. And somewhere in the 80s, um, the Bukit Timah Expressway was constructed, and it actually separated these two nature reserves. So it means that the habitat has decreased, the monkeys are confined to their restricted areas, so they can't move around, find mates, find food. And unfortunately, in 1987, the last bennett leaf monkey female uh, died in Bukit Timah Nature Reserve as it came down the trees. It was mocked to death by dogs. So it means that mm, all the bennett leaf monkeys we have in Singapore are now only found in Central Catchment Nature Reserve. From then on, um, there is just one scientific research done on the bennett leaf monkeys in 1994 by a master's student. It was a six months field research, and he only saw the monkeys 20 times because they were so rare. So he concluded there are probably fewer than 20 monkeys left in the wild in Singapore. And since then, there are only sporadic uh, wildlife surveys, but no one single survey that focused a lot of attention on them. So 15 years later, I came in. So I did my master's project two years, three years ago because I want to find out more information about them. I want to conserve them because I think they are part of our natural heritage and they're very charismatic animals. I think it's, we, I want to preserve them. Of course, in order to do that, I have to first find the monkeys. And with only little baseline information, I began going to the forest. So, you know, for the first two months, this is what I see in the forest. Beautiful trees, you know, butterflies, birds, reptiles, mosquitoes, uh, ticks, mites, and everything, but no monkeys. So this was what I have to, you know, endure. Yes, okay. So, well, finally, my patience paid off. For the very first time, on the, um, yes, 3rd of October, 2008. It's not playing. Is it going to play? OK. OK, so basically, as you can see, they're very hard to see from the uh, trees. They're really good camouflage. And I was so nervous. I was shaking badly, breathing really hard. I was like, is this really the monkey I'm looking for? Aren't they extinct? I'm not supposed to see them. So you know, I was like, oh, maybe I can get in some data. But because I said they were really shy, so it didn't take them very long before they say, OK, maybe it's time for me to go away. So, yes. 
And it means that for the next two months, this was the situation. So whenever I see them, they run. And whenever they see me, they run. So my data point was just like, okay, so this day, this date, I see them five seconds. Okay. But this is what habituation is about. Habituation is a process in which you need the monkeys to get used to your presence, that you are not a predator, you're not harmful, so that they can get they will allow you to get closer to them in order for you to collect information and data. Okay, so after a long time, I saw this group of monkeys and they didn't run away. They actually came closer to check me out. <laughs> they were really, really curious and they were like looking at me, is this the girl I've been seeing for like four months? And like, <laughs> but you know, I mentioned because, again, because they're very shy, they're very wary. So again, it's like, okay, it's time for me to leave. So again, they jump away. But it means that every time I go to the forest, I need to wear the same kind of clothes, bring the same backpack. And believe it or not, once I cut my hair short and they ran away. So I'm like, seriously, guys, you know, it's still me. So, you know, I had to... Okay, so after another two months of doing that, when I see this particular group of monkeys, like, okay, they, they saw me, they're probably going to run away, but, you know, guess what? <laughs> they were getting kind of too comfortable with me that they are, like, scratching, yawning, and they're, like, okay, sitting there doing their own business, like, what is this girl doing here? And you can see later on that because the monkeys are high up in the trees, probably about 15, 20 minutes high, I was actually lying on the ground, taking this video shot, I was like, everybody walking past me, the joggers are like, okay, what's this girl doing? Like, I'm on the ground with a video camera. But it finally paid off. So after about six to eight months of following them, them running away from me, I'm like depressed, but finally they kind of accepted me as like getting tired of running away from me. So it means that I collected a lot of useful information. And this was with the help of uh, NPARC's officer, Mirza Ismail. So both of us, we went out to the forest and we tracked the monkeys down. So based on about close to three, month, three years of information, we are able to give a more reliable estimate on the population we have in Singapore. So I mentioned before, about 15 uh, years ago, there are only about 20 banana leaf monkeys left in the wild. So how about now? So at present, we estimate that there are at least 40 individuals left in Central Catchment Nature Reserve in at least five groups. So the largest group that I've seen uh, consists of 40 individuals, which is it's very amazing because in a forest, after a long day, you finally see the monkeys, and then there are like 10, 14 of them dipping across the forest one at a time. So it was an orderly manner. So it's like, okay, I'm counting. One, two, three. I said, okay, three, that's about it. Excuse you. So anyway, <laughs> then you know, after a while, there's like a gatekeeper sitting there. So I was like, okay, so there are three, but why is there one individual sitting there? Then after I realized, it went off, and no one came along. So I'm like, four, five, six. I was like, okay, so they have this system of maybe counting the monkeys that are going past them. So it's really interesting. So the next question I want to ask is, are they reproducing? Are infants being born? So in the past, there are very few reports of infants, and there are also conflicting reports of the colors of the infants. Some say they are white, some say they are orange. Why is that so? Because in Asian leaf monkeys, like for example, the purple faced leaf monkey, the infants can look exactly the same as the parent when it's born. But in other cases, like the silver leaf monkey, the baby can be bright orange and radically different from the adult. So I want to find out exactly what color is the banded leaf monkey infant. Okay, so you can see in this video, there's the, the mom sitting with the infant just beside. It is actually white in color. And you can see some black bands and stripes along the back. As you jump around, you can see there's like along the tail as well. But well, as the, as the child strays away, the mom brings around and because I was staring at them, so they kind of like getting very. So what is the color of the banded leaf monkey infant? With um, well, a predation event, we see that the infants are born white in color and they have this really unique black pattern at the back. So there's a black stripe that runs across the shoulder intersected by another black line running from the head to the tail. So it's like a cruciform cross-like black pattern. 
So as it develops, um, it will slowly be covered in uh, black fur. So are they reproducing? Back in 2008, in November, we observed one juvenile, and based on the fur coloration, we estimate that they were, um, this juvenile was born somewhat in June, July. And just 2009, in July itself, we saw five infants being born. So it seems that they are reproducing around this time, June and July. And again, um, it was confirmed last year, June, I saw one newborn infant, um, which was white in color. So what is important to me this year is whether they also reproduce uh, in June and July. So for four consecutive years, maybe they have this particular uh, birth season. So it would be interesting to know why is it June, July? Is it because of a seasonal availability of food or is it the weather? Which brings me to the third question. What do they eat in the forest? Is it true that in the forest they can find that in the food is aban uh, abundant? Okay, so let me show you a video first. So this is an adult monkey feeding on. You can see it's picking only flowers from this particular tree. So contrary to popular belief that they have a lot of food in the forest, just like Singaporeans, they're really you know, particular about the kind of food they eat. They're very selective. So they only pick the ones they want to eat in the forest. And you can see a juvenile just feeding beside it with a flower in their mouth. It's important for the juvenile to feed beside the adult because they will then be able to distinguish between the kind of food that are good for them, the other kind of food which contain toxins that should not eat. I think I skipped some slides. <coughs> okay, never mind. So basically, we have identified 25 species of plants that they consume. And this is the first report of um, the feeding ecology because it's not easy to know what kind of food they eat. Why? It's not a simple case of, okay, I see them eat, okay, I pick up the leaf sample from the ground, and then I get it identified. It's not the case because it means you have to see the monkey feed about 30 meters, 40 meters away on a good day with binoculars, and they're about 20 meters high up in the forest. Once you identify the tree visually with the help of a GPS, when a monkey leaves, you go into the forest. It's swampy, a lot of fallen trees, a lot of rattans, so you have to go through them. And then once you reach that tree you think it is, you look around and be like, hmm, where is the tree? Because trust me, they look the same. So then we be like, me and Mirza be like, okay, I need, we need to get out again. So we have to go through the fallen trees, the swamps again, and then visually locate the tree, go in again. So this process takes a few times before we can finally go to the tree, get, it, um, get the leaf samples from the ground, get out again, and get the National Herbarium, National Parks Board Herbarium to help us identify. Finally, we have um, the last question I'm interested to answer is whether the Singapore population is genetically distinct from the Johor population. Because uh, for a really long time, scientists were debating whether the population in Singapore is the same as the ones in Johor, whether they are same species and subspecies. Um, they say they're different because they have different pelage coloration, different size, but no one has exactly has actually gone into testing genetics. So this is where I come in. Well, how do you get monkey DNA? First of all, you can get from blood, but it's very invasive because it means you have to bring the monkey down from the forest, draw the blood, and hopefully it can be reintroduced back into the wild. So it is very risky and dangerous for the monkeys. Another way we can get is to extract DNA from fur. And if you remember, we have this specimen in the Raffles Museum. But because it's preserved in like chemicals and formalin, the DNA has been degraded, so we can't extract any DNA. So, well, we can also get DNA from feces. Um, but getting feces is kind of even more difficult than actually seeing them feed because you have to actually see it happen. So I have this video. I was looking at this monkey and said, okay, shifting position, looking around, and start to look down and say, okay, what is it doing? Yes, so this is what I was looking for. And has it dropped down into the forest? I'm like, yes, I got it. So has it, you know, cleaned itself up? I went in to clean the forest for it. So I went for it to leave and then we went in and we were so excited to find it. So, I'm sure no one's excited as me to see shit. So after three years, we managed to find 15 fecal samples from different individuals. And this is good news because we can, um, we can get the DNA from fecal samples and test whether how diverse they are from each other. So this is how they look like. In a forest, if it's intact, it's good because you know they land nicely, I can go find it. 
sometimes it, you know, the bicycles and the trucks get there before me. So, you know, they are like, yeah, this is how they look like. <laughs> so what we did is we extracted DNA and we sequenced mitochondrial genes, some three to four genes. And we are interested to... Okay, some slides are really missing here. So, okay, unfortunately, but um, the three genes, we are in, uh, we're really fortunate to be able to collaborate with this professor, Badru Zan, from the university in Malaysia. So he has the genetic samples for uh, four populations in Malaysia, uh, in Johor in particular. So we compared the uh, three different genes, and we found out that there's only less than 1% difference. So what it translates to is that most... Um, it is highly likely that the populations in Singapore and Johor, they are the same sort species and species. So it brings up some hope because it means that it is possible to translocate individuals, possibly from Malaysia because they have uh, a bigger population over there, to bring into the Singapore population and maybe help them breed and help them increase the genetic diversity. So having said that, summary. So throughout the three years of research, I found out there are at least 40 monkeys in Singapore, which is about twice the previous estimate, but we're still not very sure whether they're doing well because 40 individuals, they might be highly inbred. So it means that the infants may not survive. So it's also critical for us to not just uh, observe the population and the behavior, but also how the infants develop. And also, uh, we found out 25 species of plants that they feed on, and it's important to know um, where exactly these trees are located so we know how they range in the forest and how important particular areas are to them. And based on genetic studies, we confirm that the um, populations in Johor and Singapore are the same species and subspecies. Um, this all seems good news, but uh, just very recently, we had a road queue. The picture is supposed to be here. Um, this monkey is a juvenile that I've been following for a while. So um, it was kind of difficult for me because I got a call and then I heard that um, there was a road queue just behind this forest patch. And then when we went down, the body has been tossed away. So, yeah, we couldn't find a carcass because well, we didn't really want, we don't want the monkey to die in vain because, yeah. So we wanted to get the carcass and then since the carcass has been thrown away, what we can do is maybe to find where exactly hap where it happened and then try to dig for blood samples. But it has been two days, so we weren't really hopeful. But with the help of like the NUS team, my lab, we managed to dig out this pebble stain with liquid Blood. So we went to the lab, we were really excited, and just recently, we managed to sequence some genes. So we are able to compare with different individuals again, and it's very important for their conservation. So uh, future work, of course, it doesn't stop here. We need to continue monitoring their population, see wh what changes uh, are occurring, and also vegetarian sampling. I said what kind of food they eat in the forest, and whether uh, the trees are... Um, how are they located? And also plant genetic extraction from fecal samples. So not just from based on observations of the plants they eat, but also from fecal samples, you can extract plant DNA and see what kind of species they eat. So it's to complement uh, feeding observations. So I'd like to thank the National Parks Board for all the logis logistics help and also wildlife reserves for funding me and my lab. So yes, that's it. So thank you very much.